I'm really interested in level design. Actually, it's what I'm trying to do professionally. I get really passionate and excited when I'm sketching an idea on graph paper, blocking it out, or putting the finishing touches on it. So I decided that I wanted to make a YouTube series to express this. Except that, while I was starting to work on a video analyzing a level from System Shock 2, I started realizing that I'd probably be throwing out terms and using approaches to looking at levels that might be unfamiliar to some people. I was already planning on this level analysis to be pretty long as is, so having to take time to cover the basics would have just added to the running time. Plus, if I wanted to cover more games in the future, I didn't want to bury this information in one particular video or have to repeat myself every episode. So, I decided that I would make this video separately, as sort of a channel intro, so I can point newcomers here in case they're confused about certain terms, and I don't have to go over this info every time I look at another level. That being said, Hi, I'm Jared Mitchell, and this is the first episode of The Playing Field. So, what is level design? There are two concepts there that we need to take a look at. One is design, which I think most people would define as something like creating a thing so that it works as intended. But I actually want to look at the thing we're designing first. What is a level? When I ask that question, you probably had an image in your head like this. Or this. Or, depending on your tastes, this. Or if you're really cool, this. But those are mostly agreed upon. You may disagree about whether or not those are good levels, but I don't think anyone would deny their... levelness. So, how about this? Or this? Or this? Or this? And I'm not talking about the surrounding area, I'm talking about the giant thing you're climbing on. Because the question of what is and isn't a level is actually a lot more ambiguous than people might initially believe. But defining what aspects make up a level will give us a good starting point to figure out what we expect a level designer to be responsible for. Let's use those four examples I mentioned earlier to look at what they have in common, and maybe some differences they have. I know this is going to seem surface level at first, but we'll really start digging into the more interesting stuff soon. But for now, what glaringly obvious things do they have in common? Well, first and foremost is gameplay. All of these particular games allow the player to move around at their will. All of them have some form of health, all four involve avoidance of things that can hurt you, and three out of four involve combat of some sort, though it's only strictly necessary in Half-Life. More formally, gameplay is broken down into mechanics and systems. A lot of gaming content on YouTube seems to conflate the two, but they're quite distinct from each other. Mechanics are easy to understand. They're actions the player can take. Running, jumping, wall sliding, shooting, and plenty more. Systems, however, are a little more abstract. Basically, they're sets of rules that define the current state of the game. Typically, they take a player input, run that through the rules of the game, and then generate an output that changes the game's state. That sounds really complex, but think of it this way. Shooting is a mechanic, while your ammo count is a system. When you shoot, the ammo system takes that as an input, uses a rule, in this case, decrease ammunition by one, then changes the game's current state by decreasing your ammo count, and outputs one bullet. But not all systems involve inputs and outputs, they're just sets of rules. Think of a chessboard. It doesn't take input or give output, but it defines movement. The player's pieces can't be wherever they want, they have to be in one of 64 distinct squares, and cannot travel off the board. For a digital example, think of the saw blades in Super Meat Boy. The player can't really do anything to change them, they can only avoid them. The easiest way to define the difference between systems and mechanics is that mechanics are verbs, while systems are nouns. Typically, systems and mechanics are designed to be modular, meaning that you can use them over and over again in different places, and they'll behave the same. Using the saw blade example, they're used in multiple levels, and sometimes multiple times in a level, but the underlying rule of touch it and you die remains unchanged. 
There are some systems that serve as one-offs, though. Think of boss fights. Bosses still have sets of rules that determine their behavior. They respond to the player input by being attacked, and they have outputs that come in the form of them losing health or attacking the player. So, you might be thinking, it seems like you're saying that obstacles are just systems and the player needs to perform certain actions to get past these obstacles. So, is a level just a series of systems that the player needs to use certain mechanics to get past? And I would say that's a very astute observation of you, a hypothetical viewer. And yes, this is one good definition of a level, a series of obstacles that tests the player on certain skills. This is the basis of something called rational level design, which is a really mathematics-based way of creating levels. But as useful as this approach can be, I don't think it encompasses everything that makes up a level. So if we look at these four levels again, what other aspects do they have in common? Well, art. I mean, duh, of course. But this isn't just pretty pictures to look at. Art assets are used to communicate where the player is and where the obstacles are. We often perceive the boundaries of these things as the boundaries of the sprites or meshes as well, even if truthfully they aren't. But art and levels affect each other in more ways than one, and often this is most pronounced in the environment the level takes place in. Take, for example, this level of Dishonored, which has the player crossing Caldwin's Bridge. One of the coolest aspects of this to me are the suspension cables that you can move on and the two giant pillars that are at each end of the bridge. The fact that this level takes place here allows these features to be included. It also makes the space of the level very narrow, but extremely tall as well, emphasizing the two spires that are part of the bridge as places the player can use for vertical movement. Because of this though, artists need to make meshes and textures as part of the bridge locale to create the environment. Now, Arcane, the studio that made Dishonored, had enough time and people to pull this off, but that's not necessarily true for every team and every project. Even in Dishonored, they use modular assets. Like the systems we mentioned earlier, these are meshes that are meant to act as reusable Lego pieces to help cut down on art scope. So when designing a level, it'd be smart for the designer to use modular assets as much as possible to prevent the art team from strangling them. Alright, one last thing that these examples have is programming to enable the content to happen. And again, I know this is really obvious, but we should look at all the different things this refers to. See, in Super Meat Boy, code is mostly limited to making the player character move, as well as the obstacles that the player avoids. Obviously the menus, level selection, and collectibles need to be implemented as well, but the bulk of the programmer's time was spent on controls and hazards. Note, though, that these pieces of code are part of the modular obstacles we mentioned earlier. Obviously, the player's controls stay consistent throughout all the levels, but the saw blades, crumbling platforms, and salt dispensers are designed in a drag-and-drop sort of way to expedite level creation. It's no surprise that Super Mario Maker, which allows you to make 2D platformer levels, has you literally drag-and-drop things into place. But not everything programmed is created to be reusable. The most obvious examples in Meat Boy are the boss fights. But the other three games we've mentioned are full of these. Just look at Half-Life 2. Typically these one-offs are either logic that enables a puzzle unique to a level, or a piece of code that helps convey some part of the story, called a scripted sequence. Typically these sequences play specific animations and sound clips, but are almost always created to be used only once. When first creating a level, the designer typically makes a design document, which outlines important things like the layout, the sequence of events, and so on. One of the most important things, though, is an asset list, which lists everything the designer would like in their level. This is usually broken down into types of assets, like meshes, textures, scripted sequences, voice acting, and so on. And, as we mentioned before, the fewer assets a level designer needs to make their level, the more likely it is that they'll get everything they requested, and the less overworked the team will be. So if we take our previous definition of a level, a series of obstacles that tests the player on certain skills, we can now add to it a bit. Let's now say a level is a series of obstacles that tests the player on certain skills created through the use of different assets. 
So remember those four other examples I cited that were kind of questionable? Let's apply our definition to those. The Walking Dead is made up of a linear series of events, which require the player to talk with NPCs, solve puzzles using items, and occasionally engage in quick time events. While talking with NPCs requires input, that's not too much of a skill, really. Figuring out the solutions of puzzles and reacting quickly to prompts, though, are, so this fits our definition of level. In Guitar Hero, the only real obstacles are the notes, aside from those boss fights in the third game. They test the player on certain skills, starting with hitting one note, to holding one note, to forming a chord, to FCing Raining Blood. It's interesting, though, that the notes are placed more to emulate the guitar part of the song, so the designers couldn't just place notes wherever they wanted to test certain skills. Still, I feel comfortable calling these levels. Civilization is where things start to get hairy. The way most people play Civilization is on a randomly generated map, either with friends or against AI. While the player can specify certain traits for the resulting map, it's not created by a designer. However, there are specific scenario maps, which have a determined layout and number of players, most notably the Conquest's expansion pack for Civilization 3. So, randomly generated maps aren't levels, but scenario maps are, which is admittedly a bit confusing. And lastly, Shadow of the Colossus. Obviously, the environment itself is deliberately designed, but think about the colossi themselves. They have specific paths of fur and platforms along the surface of their bodies, and require the player to get to certain vulnerable spots. It's very clear that the designers require specific actions from the player to kill the colossi. However, there are certain fights where all you need to worry about is getting onto the colossus's body and stabbing them. But there are others that require the player to use the environment or certain objects in order to accomplish this. So, some colossi are levels, but others are only part of a level. Wow, that sounds weird. It seems that our definition of level is something we can work with. Now that we've established that, let's shift our focus to design. What is a level designer responsible for? Maybe we can look at a few different level designer openings at companies to get a sense of that. Take, for example, this opening at Bethesda, which is always up. Not that I've looked at it a lot. Under Requirements, Bethesda asks for an excellent sense of 3D game space, storytelling, and pacing, as well as experience designing, building, and populating game levels. They also want their level designers to have experience scripting or programming complex interactivity and gameplay, excellent communication skill, experience with modular kits, and creative and dialogue writing would be a plus. I mean, obviously experience making levels would help, and the emphasis on 3D space makes sense, since Bethesda's games are 3D. Remember how I mentioned modular art assets earlier? Well, Bethesda uses them a lot, so it's not a surprise that they're mentioned here, and Bethesda's games are very narrative heavy, so it's pretty apparent why they'd like applicants to have experience with writing and storytelling. It looks like they expect their designers to be able to script as well, and given that they'll be talking with artists and programmers, communication skills definitely help. Lastly, they briefly mention pacing. Keep that in mind. Next, let's look at this one from Valve, which is also always up. So the duties section here says that working at Valve will require you to participate in design sessions to create the outline of game experience. Well, that's interesting. They also expect level designers to build the game world in 3D and use entity scripting to create cinematic sequences of gameplay. Hey, scripted sequences, remember those? You'll work with artists, animators, writers, and programmers to implement elements such as art, animation, story, and design requirements, which explains not only the importance of communication, but why it's needed. Lastly, they need level designers who can participate in observed playtesting and create work items based on observations and analysis of playtesting data, and manage and prioritize bug lists. Well, that's a new one. There's some differences here. Bethesda has emphasis on writing, 
While there are writers at Valve, Half-Life isn't remembered mostly for its story. Valve also mentions needing to participate in playtesting and bug fixes. Frankly, I'm surprised this isn't mentioned in Bethesda's posting. However, there's a lot more similarities to the Bethesda one. Expecting you to create a 3D layout, either in the creation kit for Bethesda or presumably Hammer for Valve. They expect you to script gameplay in sequences, though it's worth noting that scripting in Hammer is more visual than actual code writing. Communication, as always, is important because you'll be talking to people from other departments. And lastly, there's Bethesda's mention of pacing and Valve's mention of creating the outline of the game experience, which basically sounds like a fancier definition of pacing. Let's look at one last opening. This one's for a senior level designer for Overwatch at Blizzard. The responsibility section is more succinct, which mentions designing and creating 2D multiplayer level layouts that complement and help showcase the game's systems and player abilities. As I mentioned earlier, this is basically a level design document, and I'm kind of surprised the previous two openings didn't mention this. This opening involves translating approved 2D level layouts into playable design blockouts using our in-house tools, and working collaboratively with artists and designers, which is also mentioned in the other two. Lastly, you'll iterate constantly to find the most fun in your levels as possible, which is hinted at in Valve's opening with the playtesting responsibility. You'll notice, though, a couple of things absent from this one, chief among them being scripting. It's not just that they don't ask the applicant to script, it's that they don't mention scripting or programming at all. Another thing they don't mention here is writing, either as an expectation of level designers or as a department that the designer would have to interact with. So why is this? Well, consider that this opening is specifically for Overwatch, a multiplayer game, while the openings for Bethesda and Valve don't specify which project they're for. Bethesda's best-known work is exclusively single-player, while Valve has a healthy balance between single and multiplayer. Remember how I mentioned that scripted sequences are usually intended as one-offs? Well, that's fine in Half-Life as well as, say, a dungeon in Skyrim, because you're only expected to play through those once. But in Overwatch, players are going to be running around the same areas over and over and over again, so it's apparent that scripting probably won't fit in this scenario. Now consider the same situation, but instead of scripting, think of the players receiving a big plot dump at the beginning of every match on the same map. Yeah, that wouldn't be ideal. There are a few similarities with all of these jobs. Planning a layout, implementing them in the editor, working with other disciplines to finalize the level. But there are just as many differences. Bethesda emphasizes writing, Valve finds playtesting and bug fixing to be important, and Blizzard doesn't require scripting. See, the truth is, when we ask, what is level design? Depending on who you ask, you're going to get different answers. But let's focus on the commonalities. The first one I want to talk about is pacing. When we think of that, it's typically monitoring something relative to the time we've invested in a piece of media. For instance, in movies or books, pacing typically tracks dramatic tension over time. There's a great Extra Credits episode looking at pacing in games, and the biggest takeaway from that episode is the interest curve, which is a good general purpose tool for pacing. But games aren't always that narrative heavy, so what exactly are we measuring over time in a level? Simple. Difficulty. Now, you don't have to follow the interest curve. There are plenty of examples both within games and outside of games that don't. But using this to map the difficulty of a level is a useful starting point. There's multiple ways to do this, but the way I was taught was to use a graph from 0 to 100, where 0 means impossible to fail and 100 means impossible to succeed. Avoiding the extremes, though, is probably for the best. It would be kind of jarring to have obstacles in your level jumping between a 10 and a 90. So, remember Valve's definition of pacing? Participate in design sessions to create the outline of the game experience? Well, that implies you're going to be working with other level designers, but it also implies some form of pacing being applied to the game as a whole. And this is absolutely what happens. A team of designers comes together and says something like, this level in the middle of the game needs to have an average difficulty of 50, and then the designer responsible for that level will create a pacing curve that stays within a range of, say, 30 to 70. So to state it in a way that will piss off a lot of Mario Maker players, 
Making difficult levels does not make you a good level designer. Making levels with the appropriate difficulty does. Now that we've covered that, I want you to imagine a Half-Life level that hits its intended difficulty perfectly and has perfect pacing, but is in a straight concrete hallway with no windows. Not terribly exciting, right? One of the other things that the design team needs to determine for each level is its environment, where it takes place. This is usually joined in with the narrative of the game at that point, answering questions like, why is the player here? What is this location? Where's the player headed to? And what does the player do here? Among others. So let's take our hypothetical concrete hall level and add a skybox above it and put some trees over the walls to really sell this as an outdoor space. However, it's still just a straight line, and I'm willing to bet most people would find this boring. The path of the level, ideally, should be interesting as well, with a lot of inclines, dips, and winding areas to make it more engaging than just holding the forward button down. One of the bigger disciplines that level designers get a lot of influence from is architecture, and something architects take advantage of frequently is flow of space. I'm not going to get too into it right now, but basically the idea is that the way people perceive space can encourage movement in certain directions. This is usually taken advantage of in more public areas, like museums and parks, and a level designer can use this to reinforce the pacing of a level. Folding the path of a level in on itself has some advantages too. Take this example from Ravenholm in Half-Life 2. This electrified fence is connected via a wire to a switch up in that room, which tells the player, hey, you need to go there. This allows for the same effect in reverse when the player makes it up there. Once they hit the switch, the consequences of their action is immediately apparent. In this way, the geometry of the level can be manipulated in order to help tell the player what to do next. One last benefit of this is that manipulating the path can help keep sight lines short, improving the performance of the game. Most people associate performance with efficient code, and while that is mostly true, the level designer takes some responsibility for this as well. Different game engines are created to be more efficient at different tasks, so the level designer needs to know what those strengths are and build their levels around that. If an open world game is having performance issues though, there's not a lot that a level designer can do since the engine is created specifically to render a very large environment. However, the Source engine, which powers Half-Life 2, is not built for open worlds and gives the designer a lot more flexibility to optimize things themselves. Going back a bit to clearly showing things to the player. I know a lot of people who have played Half-Life 2, but not the original game, which is true for a lot of sequels. So every game needs to have some sort of tutorial in order to teach the player the mechanics and systems in the game. Sticking with Half-Life, the head crab is an enemy that is present in both games, but Half-Life 2 still needs to introduce this enemy. However, stopping the player and saying, this is a head crab, shoot it, isn't a great way to teach the player. So, think about Half-Life 2. When do you first see a head crab in that game? Turns out, it's Dr. Kleiner's lab. So, pretend that you've never seen a head crab before, if you actually haven't, even better. Alex opens the door for you to enter the lab, at which point you can enter and see Kleiner searching for something, saying, where did she get to, and mentioning the name Lamar. Alex and Kleiner then have a short conversation, Barney enters, more talking, then Barney opens a door to reveal your HEV suit, the lights come on, and enter Lamar. First, she jumps from the top of the HEV container onto Barney's head, squealing as she does so. Barney freaks out in response to this, saying, get off me. After he throws her to the ground, Kleiner identifies this as Lamar, and specifies that she's de-beaked and completely harmless as she pauses for a moment on top of a locker for the player to get a good look. Lamar then jumps to the rafters and scurries off. So, if you knew nothing about head crabs prior to this, you just saw what it looked like, saw that it tries to pounce on the heads of people and heard its specific sound, saw Barney's reaction to it, indicating it's a threat, heard Kleiner explain that head crabs are normally dangerous, but this one is not, saw and heard its behavior when idle, and saw it jump to different terrain, and all of this happened while never taking control away from the player. Half-Life 2 does this a lot, and this is one of the big reasons why it's considered one of the best design games ever. Mark Brown at Game Maker's Toolkit made a video about this, and I highly recommend you watch it. 
This gets to the heart of two aspects of level design. Learning outcomes, as in teaching the player about aspects of the game, and intent, which is, in my opinion, the most important thing in creating a level. It's not enough to ask what is in this level. You also have to ask what is the purpose of this level? Why are we making this? And while something as simple as this level advances the plot is defensible, if you can simultaneously teach the player aspects of the game's rules, your level is going to go from good to great. So think about everything we've covered so far. Art scope, programming scope, audio, pacing, difficulty, environment, narrative, performance, flow of space, introducing rules, and intent. That's certainly a lot, and there are even more aspects that I've kind of glossed over, such as 2D versus 3D levels, whether you're using a first-person, third-person top-down, or other type of camera, enemy design, rewards, and whether the game is single-player or multiplayer. Like we examined before with our weird level examples, not all of these aspects may be relevant to a particular level, but finding out which aspects are relevant is the first step in level design. Now, given everything we've covered, how do we define level design using our definition of level? What are we designing our level to be or possess? In one word, experience. A designer wants their level to convey the experience they intend through the use of whatever tools they have access to, but as efficiently as possible. So, all together, level design is the consideration of different assets to create a series of obstacles that tests the player on certain skills while conveying an intended experience. Or as I put it sometimes, threading a dozen needles at once. You may notice, though, that of the aspects of level design I listed earlier, I didn't bring up systems and mechanics. Well, to wrap this video up, I actually want to go a little deeper regarding these. Obviously, levels for a platformer are going to be different than levels for a strategy game, and those are going to be different than levels for a shooter. But as it turns out, fine-grained changes in the rules of a game can have big effects on the level design, and levels in two games of the same genre even in games of the same series, can be radically different. Take, for example, the original Doom versus the new Doom. Aside from the very obvious differences in the technology, let's look at the first full fight in the new Doom and see how the design itself is different. One of the biggest things in this level and throughout the new Doom is that this fight is in an arena-shaped area and won't let you progress until you kill all the demons that are part of the encounter. In the original game, you didn't necessarily need to kill every enemy, though you were certainly incentivized to do so. The arenas in the new Doom are all also in a vague circular or rectangular shape, encouraging sideways movement to shoot while avoiding fire. And most of the game consists of these fights. And while the original does have some good arena-like areas, there are some encounters that happen in some restrictive, awkwardly shaped areas too. One of the biggest changes is technologically inspired though, and it's pretty simple. In the original game, you can't look up or down, you're always facing horizontally, since technically Doom's engine wasn't actually rendering anything in 3D. Enemies can be placed at different heights, and the player just needs to face in that direction, regardless of height difference, in order to be able to hit them. However, this means that large changes in elevation at a close distance means it's really difficult to see what you're aiming at, so most of the time enemies that are higher up or lower down are often first seen from far away. In the new Doom, however, these aren't issues, and the first arena shows how the whole game takes advantage of this. Obviously looking up and down or in, because that's been available since, you know, Quake. On top of that, new Doom allows the player to both double jump and climb up ledges, allowing more efficient vertical movement. The most dramatic height change are these pillars right next to the low center area. Having them so close to such a tight space below would have been frustrating in the original game, but here it's not a big deal. Note that these changes to the rules of the game allow for more complex behavior from the imps as well, who can climb up walls and hang halfway up these pillars while attacking you. Think about this. This is the result of slight changes to two mechanics in two different shooters. Despite the many similarities in the gameplay, the best practices for these two games can be quite different. This is referred to as the design philosophy, a set of rules that the level designers follow to ensure their levels work well within the game and to maintain a coherent style. This often dovetails with the game philosophy. 
the central idea that every element of the game needs to reinforce. Often this can be expressed in one sentence. For instance, the game philosophy for Alien Isolation is something like require the player to keep track of the alien at all times, and the design philosophy supports that with rules like the alien always has an equal or greater amount of available paths than the player. But instead of seeing the finalized game and being able to reverse engineer this from it, the design team needs to figure that out as they work on the game. So how do you take a bunch of systems and mechanics and figure out the design philosophy that results from it? At this point, I don't have any answers left. I'm going to go a little off script here, so please bear with me. So a little background about myself. I went to college for a four-year degree in game design, and it was only a couple months ago that I actually got hired for my first level design job, um, which is exciting, but I'm not exactly the most experienced person or the most senior person to be talking about level design, so I don't really consider myself an authority here, at least not much of one. The thing is, the more I get into level design, the more I realize that there's like really deeper concepts that influence good level design that I just had no idea existed before. I want to be better at my job, so I want to set up this YouTube series as sort of a deliberate practice. Like, I'll take a level from a particular game and get more practice on figuring out what the philosophy is, so that hopefully when I make levels uh, professionally, I will have a better sense of that sort of aspect and you know, hopefully that'll reflect a better quality in my work. The other thing that's really motivating me to do this is my perception of game design changing over the course of my education, because I found out that uh, game design is way more work than I had ever previously thought um, before going into college, and um, I certainly see that among um, the gaming community, they sort of have the same attitude towards design. You know, most people are healthy about it, they're fine, but then there are other people who say things like, you know, oh, the developer was lazy, or the level design in this game sucks, and then they don't, like, tell you why, or saying things like, oh, I could have done better, or one person finds some insightful nugget of game design knowledge in, like, a, a rant video on YouTube, and then, like, commenters all over YouTube just keep mimetically repeating that one thing as if it applies to all cases. And I don't mean to be hard on the public either, because I... I've worked with people in the industry prior who just don't value design, like non-designers that I've worked with in a professional game studio have told me things to my face like, your levels suck and you had absolutely no thought going into making them, and I sort of find it frustrating. I know this is just one case, but there's also that case with like Half Brick, that mobile developer in Australia who a couple years ago just said like game designers don't exist at our company anymore. I think that game design as a discipline is really undervalued and I want to make this YouTube series not just to become a better designer myself but just to hopefully communicate to everyone how much work actually goes into game design. Hopefully that's something that people find interesting, because I find it interesting, because it's part of my job. But, you know, I hope that other people will be willing to watch this as well. So I sincerely want to thank you for uh, listening this far, and for letting me indulge in this sort of mini rant at the end. Uh, the next video I'm going to make is actually what I wanted to get to, which is deconstructing a System Shock 2 level. So hopefully I'll be able to better communicate what I'm trying to do with this series in that episode. I hope you guys are looking forward to it, because I sure am. Thank you very much, uh, and have a good day. I want to give a special thanks to all the people I ran this by before posting it. Uh, hopefully this became a better video in the process. I also want to mention that an article I wrote for a site called Heterotopias is going to go up pretty soon. 
Uh, it's a site that's all about looking at the world building in games and trying to identify things that influenced it. I wrote about Pathologic, a game developed in Moscow that actually draws a lot from Russian history. So hopefully it's up by the time this video is posted. Thank you again for watching this first episode of The Playing Field.